Amen. Amen. So you definitely don't want to miss that. Let's go quickly to the word of the Lord, if you'll stand this morning one more time. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 3 and then Micah chapter 7. Philippians 3 and 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. And over to Micah 7, very familiar passage. We have heard this a bunch over the past year, year and a half. It says in verse 7, Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. And you may be seated in Jesus' name. I want to preach, talk, whatever you want to call it for you, to you this morning for just a few moments on this topic, failure is not final. Pastor mentioned that I am who I am because the I am says who I am. So I'm here to talk to us today um, that failure is not final. The reason why I'm going down this road, I really did not know what I was going to preach. God laid a thought on my heart, this, this thought on my heart a couple of days ago, and I kind of brushed it off for a little while, and then I, he kept guiding me back to it. And uh, I got up early this morning, started uh, jotting everything that he had been giving me. I started putting it down, typing it down, writing it down, whatever you want to say, on paper, because I really felt really, really strongly led to go down this road today. Because I think that a lot of times um, we let our failures determine who we are. We let our failures ruin what God has in store for us. We let the failure that we, that we whether it's through our fault or not through our fault, whether it's something um, that happens that is no fault of our own, or whether we mess up tragically, or uh, we, we mess up because we're just stupid, right? Human beings are stupid. Can we all agree on that? We're all flesh and spirit, right? And that flesh and that spirit constantly wars against each other. And sometimes the flesh overrides the spirit and we do stupid things. But there are some times when stuff happens and it's not our fault. Stuff, listen, there's things that happen in your life that you have no clue why it happens to you. Right? And then sometimes it's because, well, we did stupid stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but the thing I'm trying to get across to us is I think that the devil, we let the devil get in our ear and whisper to us and remind us of our failures. Now, I will tell you this. This is humorous, and you feel free to laugh. We let a guy, this is, this is satire, all right? This is not in the Word of God. We let a guy who literally lost a contest to a redneck hillbilly in Georgia Oh, my Lord. Some of y'all got that. Some of y'all look at me like, huh? Google it, kids. The historical documents tell us that the devil at one point in time did go down to Georgia. Oh, my goodness gracious. Y'all are tough this morning. Y'all, y'all, it's a song, folks. It's an old, old, old country song from the late 70s that talks about a fiddle contest where, where the devil goes down and tries to beat this guy named Johnny, and he loses. He was literally the judge of the contest, and he still lost. My point I'm trying to make, getting back into a spiritual realm, is that this is, this is the devil that we face. Yes, he's wily. Yes, he's crafty. Yes, he's smart. But here's the bottom line. He can't take anything from you that you don't give to him, all right? He, and, and, and I made a funny joke about that stupid song that I, you know, I, it, it dry, it, the song grates on my nerves because I've heard it like literally probably 85 million times in my lifetime. However, comma, the, the devil is not... Uh, all-knowing and all-powerful like God is. So when we fail and when we mess up and when we make mistakes, he's going to come after you and get in your ear and whisper that you're nothing but garbage, Sister Cricket, that you're trash. Because he knows if he can get you to start doubting yourself, he can get you to start doubting God. So I'm here to tell you, thank you very much. My voice is about gone. I'm here to tell you that failure is not final. Here's some quotes on failure. Now, I've, I've used these before. You'll always miss 100% of the shots you don't take. I always thought that quote was attributed to Michael Jordan, but it's not. It's actually a hockey quote from Wayne Gretzky, one of the greatest hockey players ever. 
Our greatest glory is not in never failing, but in rising every time we fall. Confucius said that. One of the few things, smart things he ever said. <laughs> I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. That was Thomas Edison when he was trying to create the light bulb. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, every great inventor throughout history did not invent something great the very first time they sat down at their lab bench. They failed at 100 times, 500 times, 1,000, but at that one time, and boom, now we are very thankful that we have lights, right? <laughs> Amen. Uh, I have uh, success. This is the one I really like. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Winston Churchill, who led England through World War II, said that. We have to remember that no matter what happens, our failures are not final unless we allow them to be. Right. Amen. We go, through, we go through terrible times. Folks, we, <laughs> life is not fair. Spoiler alert. Life ain't fair. Right. It just ain't fair, right? So Friday night, I'll tell this story because this is a failure story that I can attribute to me. So Friday night, I couldn't tell anybody this. I kind of told Pastor a little bit about this beforehand just so he knew uh, to pray for me <laughs> on Friday evening. But we had a 100% gate sweep from 8 p.m. to midnight Friday night on Goodfellow. If you came through the gate at Goodfellow and you were active duty military, they took your ID card, they sent you to the theater for a drug test. It, then they searched your car. They ran the drug dogs around it, all this kind of stuff, right? So that piece is irrelevant because I wasn't participating. My piece was over here at the theater where I had 400 people standing in a line outside the theater and two female stalls and two male stalls. 400 people. Really, it was probably like 200, but, you know, hyperbole for storytelling is better. Just kidding. <laughs> it literally was probably 200-plus people. I really didn't go out there and count, but it was a ton of folks down the front of the theater, around the side, and around the back. So about 10 o'clock, the wing commander, the head honcho, the big guy, comes to me and goes, Hey, Russ, come here. I need to talk to you. I'm like, oh, God. He says, How long is it going to take to get all these people tested? I said, Three to four hours. I said, Sir, I'm serious. I said, we got two stalls there, two stalls there. Two, 34 hours. That's like 200 people out here. So he goes, hold on. He goes and gets the legal guy, the lawyer that's overseeing all this to make sure we do it all legally and in order. He goes, how long? He says, tell him what you told me. He says, it's going to take three to four hours. The lawyer looks at me. He looks at the crowd. He looks at me again. I said, sir, I'm dead serious. It's going to take three to four hours. He says, cut everybody at the door. Send all these people home. Test whoever's left in the theater. I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> what? Now, see, where does the failure part came in? When we started talking about this whole thing, I should have realized that this was not going to work because of the lack of bathroom facilities. I didn't. I kept my mouth shut. And because of that, I failed this whole operation. This is my take. Nobody else blames me. But I... I I'm my own worst critic, but I failed in that endeavor because we didn't have enough space. So what did I do? I went back. I made notes that night um, and Saturday morning when I went back in to finish everything up. I made notes because I am not going to let this happen again. Now, if I do that in my secular job and in my secular life, why can't I do that in my spiritual life as well? When I make mistakes, when I, when I, when I disappoint God, when I let God down, when I don't follow through on what God's asked me to do, instead of letting the devil will get in my ear and talk to me and make and make comments and and remind me what a horrible person I am why don't I just sit down and say okay I did this I'm not doing that anymore I did this I'm not doing that anymore I didn't do this and I'm going to start doing that that's the attitude that we got to have because folks we can't let our failures be final and I'm just, I, you know, I use a lot of personal uh, stories and if you don't like it I'm sorry but I, I can't tell your stories Number one, they're your stories, not mine. Number two, you might get mad at me if I tell your stories, and uh, you may not want that out there. So I, I tell a lot of my stories, but you can probably relate. There's something uh, that you've done in your life, probably probably more than one thing, that you failed at. There's probably more than three things that you failed at. There's probably more than ten. You know, and you can just add whatever number in here you want to. But the fact of the matter is, the bottom line is you cannot let failure define who you are. You cannot let your failure be final. Look at, look at, I mean, 
I know Sister Pope hates sports. <laughs> I use a lot of sports references. I'm sorry, Sister Pope. But folks, look at, look at how many, I mean, I could go back and give you story after story of athletes who were absolute disasters, who rebuilt themselves into something, into a success because they didn't let their failure define who they were. There was a guy played for the Dallas Cowboys many, many, many years ago. His name was Thomas Henderson. He was called Thomas Hollywood Henderson because he was a big showboat. And so in his time in the NFL, he got addicted to drugs. During Super Bowl, I believe it was 13, uh, the Cowboys were playing series. He was on the sideline. He had cocaine mixed with nut nasal spray in his Afrin bottle on the sideline. He was snort, literally snorting cocaine on the sidelines during the Super During the biggest game, you were playing in the biggest game of your life, and he's snorting cocaine on the sidelines. So his drug addiction got a hold of him, eventually drove him out of the league. He was homeless, all this. And then one day he said, enough. He goes to rehab. Uh, I believe there was a religious experience, and I don't know what it was, but he had some kind of awakening. God spoke to him, dealt with him, whatever. He, he got cleaned up. He got off drugs. And here's the cool thing. He won the lottery, not, and this is before he got bored again. He, got, he won the lottery not once, but he won the lottery twice. So all that money he lost because of his drug. And I'm not saying go play the lottery, okay? Pastor, I'm not saying go play the lottery, all right? I'm not saying go play the lottery. But, but this man, he, he, he became a success, took, and he took the money. Money that he won and turned it in to a, a business where he could help those that were homeless and whatnot. He became a success because he did not let his failure define who he was. But, and that's just a secular story. Again, I'm not saying go play the lottery because don't use your money for something good, not something like that. But the fact of the matter is when you fail, and you're going to, folks, you're going to fail. I'm going to fail again. I'm going to make a mistake again. I'm going to do stupid stuff, but I'm still going to get right back up and keep going because the I am tells me who I am. Not the devil. The devil doesn't define who I am. The Lord defines who I am. And, don't, and I'm telling you, the devil will get in your ear. He's going to talk to you. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> yeah, amen. Amen. <laughs> Do you battle failure? Do you battle when the, does the devil talk to you when you, yeah, come on now. You just failed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Amen. Pastor and I, we, we discuss a lot of stuff. We, I mean, we, we talk a lot of times about different things and, and how we've overcome certain things. And, and, the, and the common theme is we don't let the failure define us. We don't let the failure keep us down. I, I've messed up in my professional career. Pastor's messed up in his, in his contracting stuff, his, his, his drywall, whatever. But, but we don't let that define us because we get up and we move on. Man, we cannot afford to look behind us at where we used to be or what we used to be or at our failures. We've been, liver, been delivered from that sin. We've been set free from bondage. We are blood-bought and full of the Holy Ghost. We need to stay on the path that God has put us on and quit looking behind us. Many trials and circumstances will come your way and try to knock you off your mark. That's just life. What def how you deal with it will define you as a Christian. If you get knocked off your mark, don't stay off the mark. Get back on it. You want the prize at the end. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. We're going to mess up. You're going to, listen, and, and let, let me just take that a step further. You're going to face, and I keep harping on this, and I, and, and, and I want to get this point across. You're going to face issues that aren't your fault. Right. <laughs> and, I, and I keep saying this, and I'll say it again, and if, it, if, if you get tired of hearing it, we'll just say at least he's consistent. <laughs> when my dad passed away, it's been two months. What's the date today? 22nd? Two months today. Wow, just, just hit me. <laughs> two months today, my dad passed away. I didn't want that to happen. Oh, no, can you die, please, Dad? No, I didn't want that. That's stupid. I didn't want my dad to pass away. He was getting on up there in years. He'd tell you the same story 48 times in a row. He'd ask you the same question three, 13 times in 20 minutes. And then he would look at you and go, son, I know I asked you this question, but what are you doing these days? <laughs> dad, I'm running drug testing on Goodfellow Air Force Base. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. How's that going? Good. 20 minutes later, same question, right? But it wasn't my fault that my dad passed away. I I sh I'm still struggling with it. It's two months. 
I, I keep it way pressed down here somewhere, but I still struggle with it. A, a, a picture popped up from like the 1950s that I posted a, a few years ago. I didn't post it in 1950 because there's no Facebook back then, but it was taken in the 50s at some point in time. It's a picture of my dad, black and white, uh, playing the guitar. A lot of people don't know my dad can play the guitar. I posted it like eight years ago, and it just popped up on memories today of all days. And it kind of brought tears to my eyes because I'm like, man, he, he's really gone. I'm not going to see him at Christmas. I'm not going to see him this summer. He's gone. And then I began to let, get a little depression creep in. I said, nope, we're not doing this. I'm not playing this game this morning. I'm not letting these failures define me. I'm not letting that fail. And it wasn't me. It was just his time to go. The Lord said, it's time to go. Come on. I'm taking you now. It's his time. The fact of the matter, and it's no, and let me get off that because I don't want to go down that rabbit trail, but the fact is, sometimes things like this happen that's not our fault. And we have to, you got to fight and claw and scratch to keep the devil from getting in here and whispering in your ear and trying to make you feel bad for something that's not your fault. And let me press on with this. When you do make a mistake and it is your fault, get up, repent, tell the Lord I'm sorry. Micah 7 says, rejoice not against me, O mine enemies, for when, when I fall, I will arise. Get back up and let the Lord continue to be that light unto your feet repent get it out of your heart and keep moving forward and don't let the devil whisper and talk in your ear right. this is more teachy than i thought it might be but I, I i want us to get to understand we got the holy ghost we've been born again of the water and the spirit we're on a path towards heaven and we have when we go through these times god is still there with us we're going to face temptations as long as you turn to him and keep relying on him he's not going to put you in a situation that you can't overcome by the power of the holy ghost right. friday night i was stressing big time I walked away for a minute and I, I prayed a quiet prayer over by myself because my mind was starting to spin. I felt vertigo kicking in, physical vertigo starting to make me go. I felt the room was spinning because of all the stress and pressure. I had to walk away and say, God, I, I need you right now. I need you right now. And guess what? I'm still here, right? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. He touched my body, touched my mind, allowed me to keep going on and keep pressing on. We have to remember that no matter what happens, failure is not final. When we make a mistake, get back up and move on. Repent if you've committed a sin. Repent, get up and move on. We spend way too much time worrying about our failures and not enough time moving on from them. We spend way too much time letting the devil remind us of our failures instead of rebuking him and moving on. Don't worry about your failures. Put them behind you. Repent and get up and move on. Regardless of where you are addictions some some of us have struggled with addictions and it's hard to overcome addictions sometimes we slip sometimes we fall sometimes we relapse get up repent and get the stuff out of your life and keep moving on don't let your failure define you mm. If we dwell too long on our failures, we will lose focus on what God has in store for us. One of the greatest abilities we need to develop is the ability to forget about our failures. Back to Philippians 3 and 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. Why do we need to forget about those things which are behind? Because Philippians 3 and 14 says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In order to press on toward the mark, you can't keep looking back. How many races have you ever seen where people run looking behind them? You want to see something stupid and crazy? Go, go create a race where everybody has to look behind them while they run forward. How many people do you think in the first 100 feet are going to hit the ground or run into each other or run into the crowd and knock the crowd over? Why? Because you can't see where you're going. Why do you think we t that the government and states and whatnot uh, have put all these laws in place against texting and driving? Right. Why? Because when you do this, where is your, con where is your focus? Where's the road? Out there. 
Your phone's right here. Get you, a, uh, get you some voice to text or whatever, but don't try to type and text at the same time because you're eventually going to crash. Ooh, that's a PSA, public service announcement. I'm moving on quickly from there. <laughs> if, we, if we do make mistakes, learn from them, repent of your sins, and keep moving forward, and don't look back. It's time we stop letting the devil throw our past back in our face. He's good at it. If you let the devil throw your past in your face, he will do it. I've always said, if you have a price on your soul, he will fess up the money to pay it, right? You gotta be, you gotta have, you gotta have it assured right here. You've got to have your mind made up and your heart decided there's no price on my soul. There's no price I'm gonna be willing to take to give my soul to anybody but the most high. There is nothing in this world that is worth my eternal salvation. There is no woman, there is no money, there is no job, there is no possession. There is nothing in this world that's worth my walk with God. Nothing. And until you have that in your mind. The devil will keep coming around. Keep coming. You need to get a holy restraining order against him. <laughs> I've never used that. I'm going to save that back here for next time. Never had used that before. Thank you, Lord. We need to remind the devil of Micah chapter 7. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Folks, when we cry out to him he's god does not turn his back on us hear me he doesn't turn his back on us you know what we do we turn our backs on him right. we do we we god turned his back on me no he didn't you walked away from him well god didn't hear me when i cried out yes he did you just never repented of that stupid thing you were doing that was displeasing to him right. i promise you I prom this is a promise, guaranteed, ironclad, sure bet, whatever, whatever, insert whatever uh, uh, catchphrase you want to. If you cry out to him and repent of what you're doing, I promise you he will hear your cry. I've been there, I've done that, and he's answered it. I did it Friday night, and he answered my prayer. Right then and there, no matter what it is. And sometimes it feels like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and coming back down. Keep crying out to him because he is listening. The answer may be on the way. They may just be fighting a battle to get here. And Daniel, I can't remember what chapter it was. Daniel prayed for 21 days. And finally the angel showed up and he said, we heard you the first time, Daniel. We've just been fighting a spiritual battle to get here with the answer. So don't stop crying out to the Lord because he is listening. I can hear you. I'm trying to teach, Pastor. I'm sorry. I'm trying to teach. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. That's verse 8 of Micah chapter 7. The Lord will always provide that light when you ask for it. You, we, <laughs> raise your, this is not hypothetical. This is, this is not rhetorical. This is an actual, I want a response. How many of you had a situation in your life you had no idea what was going on? That should be 100%. 100. 100%. We've always faced, all of us have at least, and how many have faced it like multiples of 10? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I could even go high as multiples of 1,000, and there goes the hand again. Because I faced stuff in my life that I had no idea, no idea why it happened. Guess what? God knew. And after a period of time, I realized, you know what? Maybe I should stop worrying about this. Maybe I should let the Lord handle this. And maybe I should just hush my mouth and let the Lord deal with this. Right. Folks, you can't fix the issue sometimes. You need to let the Lord fix it. Amen. That's another sermon for another time. Let me move on quickly. We need to tell the devil, don't be rejoicing because I made a mistake. The God of my salvation will hear me when I cry out. I will arise. That's the message we need to send to the enemies of our soul. I will arise because my failure is not final. You need to tell the devil when he comes around reminding you of what you've done. You just tell him, hey, don't worry about me. You just need to worry about your future because my future is assured because I'm following my Lord and Savior. You are going to burn forever. I'm going to live forever. So if you don't like that, see ya. That's the kind of attitude we need to take with the devil. I know this is a different context, 
And I know what Jesus was saying, but in Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It goes back to what I was talking about running the race earlier. You can't run a race looking behind you. Right? So um, when they run NASCAR races, do they drive backwards? No, they drive forward, right? They're looking in front of them because they want to see, okay, I got I to gotta duck down low. I got to go high. I got to go through the middle here. I, I got to turn now. And some of the road courses, they actually turn right as well as left. <laughs> On the oval, they turn left all the time, right? That's a joke among racing fans. Yeah, nice car never turns right, but yes, they do. Anyway, but you got, they look forward. They don't drive looking behind them because if they do, somebody's going to come. Somebody might uh, hit the brakes in front. They're going to go right smack into them. Their race day's over. It's a principle that's, that applies across everything. Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow looked back fit for the kingdom of God. Why? Because you can't plow a straight line looking behind you. I'm going to hit somebody <laughs> that's old and as unstable on my feet as I am. I'm going to run into a pew or something. I better not do that. You can't do, you can't serve God. You can't follow Christ if you're looking behind you while he's leading you forward, right? You can't, you can't follow somebody while you're looking behind you. Here's the point I'm trying to make. What does that have to do with failure? Stop looking behind you at your failure. Leave it in the sea. Pastor preaches this message sometimes, fishing in the sea of forgetfulness. When you throw that stuff and you repent of it and the Lord casts it away into the, as far as the east is from the west, don't go looking for it again. Right. This is why him and I both have said this. When you get delivered from something, don't keep remnants of it in your house. Right. If you got some extra vials... Dump it and stomp on it and crush it. Leave no remnant behind. If you, God delivered you from tobacco, don't keep a pack in the house. Throw them out. Well, just in case. No, there is. The, what did what, what, you say about tomorrow? What, you've been saying this a lot lately. If you, if you think, if you, uh, what was it? Say that, say that, say it. I can't remember how I said it, but if, if there will always be a tomorrow if there's a tomorrow. There will all, if you always say tomorrow, there will always be a tomorrow. In other words, if you keep saying, I'm going to do it tomorrow, you're never going to do it. So get the stuff. If you've got syringes in your house and the Lord delivers you from whatever you put in those syringes, if it's not insulin, I'll throw that out there. Get them out of your house. Amen. Moving quickly along because I don't want to belabor the point. We've got to keep moving forward. It's not time to dwell on our mistakes. It's time to remember that failure is not Final. We're all going to mess up. We're all going to make mistakes. But if you keep looking behind at them, you'll never get past your mistakes. Right. That's what I'm trying to get through this morning. If you can't, you, if you keep looking back at the stupid things you've done in your past, you're going to keep doing stupid things. Right. right? You'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy, I always like to say. I used to tell my young airmen, if you keep doing stupid stuff, you're going you're gonna to fulfill what I think about you right now. What do you think about me? I think you're an idiot. <laughs> I said, now prove me wrong. I don't think you can make it. Prove me wrong. I had a teacher in high school told me I'd never make it in the military. 24 and a half years later, I still remembered. At my retirement ceremony, standing there on, in front of everybody, I remembered that quote. Bitter? Not really. It motivated me. It motivated me. When the devil comes to me and says, you'll never make it, Brother Bard, it motivates me. You want you think so? Watch me. Yeah. Watch me. You'll never get a bachelor's degree. Really? Watch me. Oh, master's, you're an idiot. Watch me. Yeah. I'm still an idiot, but I have a master's degree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very smart, but by God, I have that thing on my wall that says Masters of Arts and Communication. Guess what? It doesn't matter anything in the big scheme of things, but it motivated me because one person told me one time I wouldn't do it. And so I said, oh, yeah, watch me. I wouldn't quit. I, my wife wouldn't let me quit, number one, but I decided I wouldn't quit because I didn't want that failure to define me. I didn't want that failure to be final. So here I stand before you. And listen, let me completely bring that around. I'm getting ready to close here in just a moment into a spiritual connotation. Uh, when I started my walk with God at the age of nine years old, I determined I wasn't going to quit. I backslid when I became a young man, and I was away from God for a few years. When I came back to God, I said, God, 
God, we're not playing this game anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. I purposed in my heart and my mind I was going to serve him, and I have. I've been serving him since 1990. Now, here's the deal. Did I mess up? Yes, I did. Did I make mistakes? Yes, I did. Did I relapse? You better believe I did. Am I still standing here free and clear? You better believe I am because I refuse to let failure be final. I refuse to let my mistakes define who I am. I am who I am because the I am says who I am. Amen. The devil doesn't define me. Pastor doesn't define me. Y'all don't define me. The I am defines who I am. And that's good enough for me. Let's stand this morning. Quickly coming to a close. I want to read you one more scripture. In Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not, everybody say not, be utterly cast down for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now I'm old. I've, have I, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good. Dwell forevermore. Don't let your failure be final. Don't let that failure define who you are. All those quotes I, I mentioned early on. <laughs> Thomas Edison took 10,000 times to develop a light bulb. I, folks, you may fail God 100 times, but make sure you get up 101. Just keep pressing on, keep going, because you cannot afford to let your failure be final. Will you lift your hands right now all across the sanctuary right now? Can we lift our hands in Jesus' name right now, Lord?